Section 7 of Bismarck by Georges Lacour Gaillet. Translated by M. Harriet M. Capes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4 The War of 1870, Part 1. In London, in the Salon of the Russian Embassy one evening in the month of June, 1862, the ambassador to England of Alexander II, Baron Bruno, was giving a dinner in honor of his colleague Bismarck, at that time Prussian ambassador to Paris, who had left his house in the Rue de Lille for a few days and come to London to make the acquaintance of the principal politicians of Great Britain. Among Baron Bruno's guests were Gladstone, who was then Chancellor of the Exchequer in Palmerston's ministry, and Disraeli, the leader of the opposition. After dinner, the conversation was general, but Bismarck drew Disraeli aside and talked with him for about half an hour. Later on in the evening, Disraeli went up to one of the ambassador's guests, Prince Sabinov, who was then secretary to the Russian embassy in London, and was one day to be ambassador of Russia to Constantinople. It is to Sabinov that we owe the knowledge of Disraeli's words. What an extraordinary man Bismarck is, said the future Earl of Beaconsfield. He meets me this evening for the first time and tells me all he is going to do. He will attack Denmark so as to seize Schleswig-Holstein. He will turn Austria out of the Germanic Confederation, and then he will attack France. What an extraordinary man! This conversation took place precisely in 1862 at a time when Bismarck was not yet a member of the Prussian cabinet. Two years later, in 1864, came its first application, the war with Denmark. Four years later, in 1866, came the second, the war against Austria. Eight years later, in 1870, came the third, the war against France. There was never anything of the nature of improvisation in Bismarck's policy. It was always the result of plans long studied, deeply matured. All that he did, he had fully intended. There was purpose in all his actions. In the month of September, 1868, a pronunciamento overthrew the throne of the Queen of Spain, Isabella II. One of the authors of this military revolution, General Prim, quickly perceived that it is often easier to destroy than to reconstruct. He set forth to seek a king for his compatriots, who in spite of everything kept their preference for a monarchical system. Several names were brought forward. One of them was that of Prince Leopold of Hohenzollern Siegmaringen. Nothing seemed to point to this German princeling, then about thirty-five years old, as being likely to give happiness to the Spaniards. All that he had in common with them was the Catholic religion, nothing more. But he bore a name which for the last few years had made a great noise in Europe, he was the cousin of the victor of Sedova. His younger brother, Charles, had become Prince of Romania in 1867. It is difficult to tell the exact origin of this Hohenzollern candidature. Did it come from Germany by one of the thousand channels of secret diplomacy which Bismarck kept up almost everywhere? Was it born in Spain? by means of politicians who wanted to pay court to Berlin. Two things are certain. At the beginning of 1869, Bismarck sent a professional diplomat, Theodor van Bernhardi, who was entirely in his confidence, to Madrid on a mission the secrecy of which was carefully kept. Secondly, on the 26th of April, 1869, the Augsburg Gazette published an article on Prince Leopold's candidature 
which without doubt was inspired by the Wilhelmstrasse. The Marquis de la Valette, who was then French Minister of Foreign Affairs, directed the ambassador, Benedetti, to ask the Chancellor for an explanation. The latter had probably already taken toward him the attitude he takes up in thoughts and memories, that he considered the question as a Spanish question and not a German one, and again that he was indifferent enough to the whole question. On the 11th of May, 1869, he told Benedetti that there were many reasons why Prince Leopold should refuse an ephemeral sovereignty. In reporting this conversation to Paris, Benedetti politely added, I am inclined to think that Count Bismarck did not express all he thought. Perhaps the person least impressed by this dynastic candidature was the candidate himself, to whom Bismarck was secretly giving his support. After a whole series of secret negotiations and tergiversations which lasted weeks to months in April of 1870, Leopold made up his mind to renounce entirely the candidature for the throne of Spain. But Bismarck had his reasons for clinging to the Hohenzollern candidature. War with France was a fixed idea with him. Had he not written in May of 1848 that he would have understood the German Revolution if the first impulse of the unity of German strength had been to tear Alsace from France and plant the German flag on the cathedral of Strasbourg. Since then, his innate hatred of France had added to the conviction that the war begun in 1864 and continued in 1866 would not be completed until the day when France in her turn had been vanquished. I did not doubt, he says, that there must be a Franco-German war before the general organization of Germany could be realized. Napoleon's intervention after Sadova, mild and impotent as it was, had had the effect of provoking him to a lively fit of ill-temper. Louis will pay dear for it, he said. The moment seemed to him to have come to settle once for all the accounts with France and to complete the German edifice. The Hohenzollern candidature, if one knew how to play the game, would be a certain cause of discord. In April 1870, Prince Leopold had made it known that he definitively renounced the throne of Spain. In June, he declared that he was ready to accept it. What had happened in the interval? Bismarck had sent a note to the prince and his father urgently advising them to maintain the candidature in the interest of Germany, and the prince had consented. At once Lothar Bucher, an ancient turncoat from the Republican Party of 1848, who for some years had been one of the highest officials of the Foreign Office and one of Bismarck's assistants, started for Spain. He had already been there once on the same business, of which he knew all the ins and outs. At the same time, a Spanish deputy, Salazar Mazzaredo, had been one of the promoters of the Hohenzollern candidature from 1869, went to Siegmaringen, Prince Leopold's residence, intending to overcome the prince's last waverings if he still felt any. These comings and goings had up to now let only a part of the truth transpire. On the 3rd of July, it burst forth wholly. A telegram from the Havas Agency, reproduced in the newspapers, made it known that Prince Leopold had officially agreed to be King of Spain. At once, excitement reigned in the minds of the French. After the Luxembourg business, the Spanish affair was a fresh defiance of the French. Since the 2nd of January, the minister, Emile Olivier, had inaugurated the system called the Liberal Empire. The portfolio of foreign affairs was then held by the Duc de Gramont, who in May had succeeded 
Comte d'Arrou. At once on the 3rd of July itself, Gramont telegraphed to Monsieur Le Sourde, who was in charge of the French embassy at Berlin, in the temporary absence of Benedetti, asking for explanations from the Wilhelmstrasse. Bismarck was not in Berlin. The official who received Monsieur Le Sourde in his place told him that the Prussian government knew nothing of the affair. It concerned Spain, and General Prim was the person to address. Forty-eight hours later, on the 6th of July, Gramont made a warlike declaration from the tribune of the Corps Legislatif. He said he was ready to fulfill his duty without hesitation or weakness. On the 7th, he telegraphed to Benedetti, who was at Vilbat, to go to Ems, where William I was taking his annual cure, and to obtain from him, as head of the family, the disavowal of the Hohenzollern candidature. When, much later, he wrote his Thoughts and Memories, Bismarck insisted on the conciliatory disposition his master had shown under these circumstances. For this, he gives two reasons. The king was seventy-three years old. He could not look without uneasiness on a war which might discredit his laurels of 1866. On the other hand, he was under the influence of the queen, who, with her want of national sentiment, had begged him with tears to avoid war, remembering Jena and Tilsit. Does this deserve to be entirely believed? Did not Bismarck see two kinds of advantage in representing things after this fashion? The advantage of once more speaking ill of a woman whose vexatious influence he had never ceased asserting, and the advantage of keeping for himself evil genius the whole merit of the rupture by throwing William's part into the shade? But it does not do in this or other matters, to reduce so greatly the role of the King of Prussia. Nothing Bismarck did in this business was unknown to his master, and when Bismarck took upon himself the dealing, after his own diabolical fashion with the M's telegram, the King made no objection to his minister, nor addressed any reproach to him. The least that can be said of William I is that his moral complicity is always to be found at the bottom of these Machiavellian plots. As Henri Bergson has said recently with acute penetration, his state of mind must have been that of the complacent husband who asks nothing but to let the household reap the benefit of a certain situation, but who would be seized with an almost sincere scruple if he could no longer be deemed to know nothing about it. Let us return to the measures Benedetti had been ordered to take with the king. He was received at Ems on the 9th of July. To Benedetti's words the king replied that the matter depended not on him but on his cousin. He would ask him once more to renounce it. On the 12th of July, a telegram arrived from Siegmaringen. Prince Leopold complied with his wish and gave up definitively. The king communicated the joyful news to Benedetti and wrote to Queen Augusta, It is a stone lifted from my breast. Neither did Napoleon III conceal his satisfaction. He said, The island which had suddenly risen from the sea is covered afresh by the waters, there is no further motive for war. Alas, the mad recklessness of Gaumont and the unscrupulous perfidy of Bismarck had still to be counted with. La Bruyere said, There are only two ways of raising oneself in the world, our own ingenuity or the imbecility of others. At this moment Bismarck held both these trumps in his hand. But not content with the definitive renunciation of Prince Leopold, Gramont took upon himself, on the evening of the 12th of July, to telegraph fresh instructions to Benedetti. 
in order he said that this renunciation should produce its full effect it would seem necessary that the king of prussia should associate himself with it and assure us that he will not again authorize this candidature benedetti received this telegram in the night and a few hours later on the morning of the thirteenth of july he accosted william in a walk in the park of ems with caution he told him of the difficult mission entrusted to him the king was surprised i assure you he said that i have no hidden plan this affair has worried me too greatly that i should be tempted to let it arise again but truly it is impossible for me to go as far as you wish during the day the king ordered his aide-de-camp prince ratzivill to communicate to benedetti the official letter of renunciation he had just received from siegmaringen and to tell him that he looked upon the affair as finished the ambassador insisted on having another audience the king replied through ratzivill that he refused to enter into another discussion what he had said in the morning was his last word in this affair the comte benedetti might rely entirely on his words ratzivill added that his master who was leaving the next day authorized benedetti to come and take leave of him when he left such are the events that took place at ems on that historic day of the thirteenth of july the relations between the king and the ambassador had been marked by perfect correctness no one had been insulted and benedetti never complained of an insult in the course of the afternoon the councillor of legation abeken who accompanied the king was ordered to send to bismarck at berlin a telegram relating all the incidents since the morning the chancellor had left berlin for his estate in pomerania at the beginning of june at varzen he was as it were behind the scenes he could follow and inspire events without being seen or discovering himself he heard of gramont's bellicose declaration of the sixth of july and at once told his faithful maurice bush the press referent to get articles into the papers against the threats and provocations of the french cabinet at the same time he sent telegram after telegram to william i to prevent any concession on his part the thing was working out admirably it must not be allowed to miscarry at the last moment on the twelfth of july bismarck left Bartzen to get into touch again with his friends Rune and moltke as i went by vassa he says my friend the old pastor mullert was standing at the door of the presbytery and nodded to me in a friendly way sitting in my open carriage i answered with a gesture that meant a fencing bout and he understood that i believed i was leaving for war arriving at berlin on the evening of the twelfth the chancellor learned that the hohenzollern candidature was definitely given up under the lash of deception and anger he sent the king his resignation both as president of the council and chancellor william replied by calling him to ems but he was determined to stay in berlin if i go to ems he thought everything will go to rack and ruin in the most favorable case we shall arrive only at an unsatisfactory compromise and then the only thing possible the only honorable solution the only great solution will escape us on the thirteenth of july telegrams were exchanged between ems and the wilhelmstrasse fortunately he says the french short-sighted and arrogant at this moment did all they could to get the cart into the mud again he was informed of a demand of the emile olivier cabinet which joined in the proceedings of benedetti the king was asked to address a personal letter to napoleon the third saying that it had never been his intention to do anything against the interests or dignity of the french nation 
Bismarck telegraphed, It is impossible to sign. That evening Bismarck received at his table his friends Rune and Moltke, and they all three talked over what had happened at Ems that morning and the day before. The Chancellor kept on speaking of his intention of retiring. During dinner he was given the telegram Abeken had sent from the King at Ems in the afternoon. It was a long dispatch, two hundred and thirty words, in which the incidents concerning Benedetti's proceedings were reported in correct diplomatic style. I read it aloud, and Moltke's face changed abruptly, his body bent, he looked old, broken, and infirm. The telegram made it clear that His Majesty was yielding to the pretensions of France. My guests were so cast down that they forgot to eat or drink. As for himself, he was thinking what would become of Prussia in face of the Germanic body. The resolute and valiant policy of Prussia had, for its rules of conduct, they must be again quoted, reason and loyalty, from these came the aureole that surrounded her. This aureole would be irrevocably lost, or at least for a long time, if in a question of national honor an idea were to spread among the people that the insult of France, Prussia is afraid, were really justified. The end of Abeken's telegram left the Chancellor the burden of deciding if the events at Ems ought to be communicated to the press. Bismarck grasped at once the effect that could be obtained. The question was to draw up a new telegram wherein only one fact would be put in evidence, the refusal of the king to receive the French ambassador again. In such a fashion as to give this fact the character of an insult addressed to France, it would be a war without doubt, but was victory certain? Bismarck turned to his two friends. We are ready? We are ready, answered Rune and Moltke. Bismarck was waiting only for this categorical affirmation. He sat down at a little table standing near, re-read Abeken's telegram, erased several passages, and condensed the two hundred and thirty words into a hundred, which announced, without being followed by any explanatory commentary, that His Majesty had refused to receive the ambassador again, and had let him know, through the aide-de-camp, that he had nothing more to communicate to him. Then he held out the new telegram, thus condensed, to Moltke and Rune, and asked them, Well, like this, how does it do? Ah, like that, they exclaimed, it's perfection. Moltke seemed to grow visibly taller and younger. At last he had got his war, the war for which he had prepared in a military sense, with the same tenacity as Bismarck from the political point of view. The chief of staff could not contain himself for joy. That's a quite different sound now, he said. One might have thought at first it was to sound a parley, but now it's like a flourish of trumpets in answer to a challenge. The two guests had undergone a visible transformation. All at once, relates Bismarck, they had regained the wish to eat and drink and were talking in a joyous fashion. Rune was saying, The God of the ancient days, it is the good old God dear to William the Second, still lives and will not allow us to succumb shamefully. Moltke emerged from his cold passivity and forgot his usual circumspection in talk so far as to say while he looked merrily at the ceiling and struck his breast with his hand, if it is given to me to live long enough to lead our armies in such a war, let the devil carry off this old carcass immediately afterwards. The same evening the text of the Ems telegram, that is to say the text of the telegram faked by Bismarck, was sent to the press and the agencies. On the 14th of July, all Europe knew of it. In Paris and Berlin, it was like the explosion of a bomb. Bismarck 
had foreseen it clearly, it was like a red rag to the Gallic bull. Crowds filled the boulevards, crying, Ah, Berlin, ah, Berlin! Could there be any hesitation when William had voluntarily given France a slap in the face, so to speak? At Berlin there was the same excitement from the opposite point of view. Bismarck, Rune, and Moltke had gone with the crown prince to Brandenburg to meet the king, who was to return to the capital that same day. As the royal carriage traveled toward Berlin, Bismarck explained to his master what he had done. The king approved. There had been a question of assembling the council the next day for the mobilization, but on their arrival at Berlin the king and his councillors heard of the military preparations of the Emile Olivier cabinet. Wilhelm asked Rune if the entire army could be mobilized. Yes, your majesty, answered the minister unhesitatingly. Everything is in readiness. There is no difficulty about it. That very hour mobilization was decided on, and the crown prince in person announced the news to the crowd. Then was sung the Wacht am Rhein, amid frantic cries of, Long live the king, down with France. Events hastened on. On the 15th of July, the corps législatif, in spite of the opposition of Thiers and several deputies, voted a credit of fifty millions asked for by Olivier. On the 19th of July, Bismarck went to the Reichstag. I announced to the High Assembly, he said, that today the French chargé d'affaires has sent us the declaration of war. The forger of the Ems telegram had attained his end. He had got the war he wanted for grouping round Prussia all the German states, and he had got it under the conditions he had wished for. From the moment when France took upon herself the breaking of the peace, Prussia found she had the right of legitimate defense. Here, then, was the last issue of a cleverly contrived lie. Still, it must be added that the false telegram of Ems was but the spark which set fire to a powder mill full to the brim. The war between France and Prussia had not the character of a surprise. Prévost Paradol had already spoken of it in 1868 in La France Nouvelle as of imminent certainty. But that does not alter the fact that at the outset of the War of 1870 there was the fabrication and use of falsehood as at the outset of the War of 1914, there was the theory of the scrap of paper. Natum mendacio genus, a race born for lying. This testimony of infamy dates from the first century of our era. In the 19th century, in the 20th century, it still remains an expression of the truth. Bismarck left Berlin for France on the 31st of July at the same time as the king. He left quite at ease. The Reichstag, before separating, had voted the 120 million dollars government had asked for. The southern states had mobilized their troops and joined them to those of the Confederation. On the 25th of July, the Times had published a plan of alliance between France and Prussia, which in August of 1866 Benedetti had imprudently left in Bismarck's hands, in which there was talk of the possible acquisition of Belgium by France. France at Antwerp. What a terror to England. It was not England that was going to intervene for France, nor Russia, nor Austria, nor Italy. France was therefore to remain with no allies. As for Prussia, she needed none. The superiority of her military preparations was almost a warrant of her certain success. The Chancellor followed the War of 1870 more or less as a spectator, for here the chief role was resumed by the men of war, and the staffs, remembering his interference in the campaign of 1866, this time kept him in the background as much as possible. In the train that took him to Cologne, 
he had heard General von Podbielski, while talking with Roon, congratulating himself because precautions had been taken to exclude him from military deliberations, whereupon he developed a feeling of ill-temper against the generals that he took no pains to conceal. As for himself, what he wanted above all was to impress public opinion with the objects of the German war. He told Bush to spread abroad his ideas in the press, such as he had expressed in a conversation at pont a mousson on the 22nd of August. A pecuniary indemnity would only weaken France temporarily. What we demand is prolonged security for our frontiers, and we shall obtain that only by changing the two fortresses which are a menace to us into our own protecting ramparts. Strasbourg and Metz must cease to be points of attack for France and become places of defense for Germany. On the 29th of August, at clermont en argonne he said to the correspondent of an English newspaper, We ought to take and keep Strasbourg and also Metz, if our armies are victorious. Strasbourg will be our Gibraltar. You tell me that France will hate us horribly if we take Alsace and Lorraine from her, and that she will always seek to revenge herself? I grant it but it is certain that the French are already furious enough to seek to revenge themselves in any possible manner. The best we can do in the interests of peace is therefore to take away from them the power of doing ill. Although there is no advantage to us in annexing Alsace and Lorraine, we must first of all provide against an attack of the French. The professors beyond the Rhine invented too late the doctrine of historical rights over our eastern provinces. In their schools and universities they have taught that the real limits of France are those of the Treaty of Verdun, the Treaty of 845, and that what is beyond these is part of the German lands and foreign parts, Deutsche Ausländer. When he heard these theories over which he must have shrugged his shoulders, Bismarck must have thought of his teacher, Frederick II, at the time when the latter was entering Austrian Silesia like a thief. I take first. I shall always find pedants to establish my rights. But as for Bismarck, anyhow at this date he was more frank. If he took French territory, it was simply for military reasons, just as later on in the Reichstag he has cynically to explain, still apropos of Alsace and Lorraine, his theory of the glacis. As early as the 14th of August, that is when scarcely a week had passed since the Battle of Wörth, while Strasbourg and Metz were still intact, an order from the cabinet, dated from the general headquarters at Erny, Department of the Moselle, and completed eight days later at pont a mousson by a letter from the King of Prussia to Bismarck, established the general government of Alsace-Lorraine. A cousin of the Chancellor, Count Frederick von bismarck bohlen was appointed governor-general. The territory assigned her on the map, comprised already from the 14th of August, all that part of France with the exception of Belfort, which was to be torn from her at the Treaty of Frankfurt. End of Section 7「Section 8 of Bismarck by Georges Lacour Gaillet, translated by M. Harriet M. Capes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 4. The War of 1870, Part 2. The King and the Chancellor had entered France by Forbach. After passing through Gravelat, Pont-a-Mousson, and Commercy, they were going toward Paris when Moltke abruptly altered the marching orders of the armies. He had just heard that Mac Mahon was trying to bear to the northeast to the relief of Bazaine. 
who had shut himself up in Metz. On the 27th of August, Bismarck wrote to his wife, Mac Mahon has escaped us by Reims. He made a double, as it is called in hunting, and we are trying to cut him off by pursuing him and forcing him to give battle. On the 30th of August, the Chancellor was present at the Battle of Beaumont, which was, as it were, the preface to the surrounding of the French. The German troops were close on the heels of Mac Mahon's troops, which flowed back towards Sedan, but with the intention of stealing into Mezières. They were too late, and on the 1st of September the great battle took place. From the hillock of La Marfe, in the village of Frenois, on the southwest, and at the threshold of Sedan, Bismarck, standing beside the king, Rune, and Moltke, followed its vicissitudes, field-glass in hand. But he felt like a spectator who knows the play will end well, and who is ignorant only of the moment when the curtain will fall. On the right, the eastern side, he had seen the savage resistance and the fire at Bazeille. In front of him, on the northern side, he had seen the two jaws of the German armies close at the cavalry of Ely, and the French army caught in a terrible net of fire and steel. He had seen the French cavalry dash forward in violent charges, facing the west, and against the foot soldiers and gunners of the eleventh and the fifth Prussian corps, he had heard King William hailing the heroism of those squadrons, charging, falling back, charging again, with untiring fury, with a cry of admiration, Oh, the fine fellows! At about three o'clock in the afternoon the tragedy was nearing its end. The white flag was floating from the turret of the town. Then William sent to the army and to the town a summons to surrender. At the close of day, a French envoy, General Ray, arrived, bringing the letter in which Napoleon III delivered up his sword to the hands of the victor. The spectators on La Marfe dispersed then. Bismarck and Moltke went to Donchery, about five kilometres from Sedan, and the commander-in-chief of the vanquished army, Wimpfen, came to meet them in this small town to discuss the fate of his unfortunate soldiers. The discussion between the three men lasted until past midnight. In his cold, peremptory voice, Moltke at once laid down his conditions. The entire army was to be made prisoners of war. Wimpfen, in a trembling voice, strove against this. He failed to obtain the smallest mitigation. Several times Bismarck interposed to enforce his friend the general's words. It was France, he said, that declared war. Germany desires the prompt re-establishment of peace. We ought not, therefore, to neglect any means of shortening the duration of the struggle, and one of the most efficacious is to deprive France of an important army. Therefore, after having deliberated on the matter, we have decided that these should be our conditions. Your army will lay down its arms and be sent prisoners to Germany. Still he persuaded Moltke to consent to the prolongation of the armistice till nine o'clock the next morning, no ill consequence could result from this, since the French army was surrounded on all sides. A few hours later, about six o'clock in the evening, Bismarck was awakened in order to inform him that Napoleon III wished to see him. He dressed in haste and started on horseback for Sedan. As was his custom during the war, he wore his military costume, the undress tunic of the yellow regiment of the heavy cavalry of the Landwehr, the white cap, and the big top boots. At about three kilometres distance near Frenois, he met the imperial Landau. Alone in the presence of the emperor and the officers with him, he instinctively felt for his revolver. Napoleon saw the action, but Bismarck 
resumed a correct demeanour and gave the military salute. A short conversation took place. The emperor wished to see the king. Bismarck replied that the king was too far off. In reality, he did not want Napoleon to see his master until all the conditions of the capitulation had been signed. Then, where was one to wait? For the emperor would not return to Sedan. Then, altogether, they took the road back to Donchery. Shortly after reaching it, Napoleon and Bismarck stopped at the small house of an artisan by the roadside. Together they went up a wretched staircase into a mean room on the first floor, where a deal table and two armchairs were all the furniture. What a contrast with their last interview at the Tuileries! They were alone, and for about three-quarters of an hour they talked. Napoleon deplored this fatal war. He had not wished for it. It had been forced upon him by the pressure of public opinion. Bismarck answered that neither in Germany had anyone desired war. The Hohenzollern candidature concerned Spain and not Germany. The emperor spoke of obtaining less hard conditions for the army of Sedan. The chancellor alleged that this was a question purely in the province of the military. Then Moltke appeared for a moment and declared that nothing of the conditions named to Wimpfen could be altered. He would go to refer them to the king. Napoleon said that being a prisoner, he could not himself treat of peace. The government of Paris alone could do so. The conversation continued in the garden, and then the emperor was conducted to the Chateau de Belfort. It was there that at noon the capitulation was signed, and afterwards, at the same place, there was a short interview between William I and Napoleon III. On leaving this interview, the emperor again spoke to Bismarck, and they saluted each other for the last time. The next day, the 3rd of September, William received at his table at headquarters the three men who had prepared for this brilliant triumph of Prussian arms and policy. At the close of the repast, he drank to them in these terms. To you, Minister Roon, who sharpened the sword. To you, General von Moltke, who used it. To you, Count Bismarck, who have brought to its present height Prussian policy by directing it for long years. The victors of Sedan had started at once for Paris. The general staff and Bismarck stayed for some days at Reims. There must not be left any doubt in the minds of the members of the new government in Paris of Germany's aims, which the victory of Sedan seemed to have brought much nearer. Therefore the Chancellor addressed a circular in which the question of Strasbourg and Metz were set forth anew to all his diplomatic agents. It said, While France remains in possession of Strasbourg and Metz, her offensive organization will be stronger than our defensive on the south of Germany and on the left bank of the Rhine. In the hands of France, Strasbourg is a side door always open toward southern Germany. In the hands of Germany, on the contrary, Strasbourg and Metz acquire a defensive character. The greatest publicity was given in the German press to this official circular. Still, while preparing for a war à outrance, the government of national defense thought it its duty to enter into relations with the victor, to whom they addressed the appeal that he was making war on Napoleon the Third and not on France, did not the fall of the emperor now permit of talk of an armistice while awaiting peace? The unhappy mission of conferring with Bismarck fell to Jules Favre. Both physically and morally, no two men could have been more dissimilar than these. Bismarck, then fifty-five years old, Jules Favre, sixty-one, the one enormous, built like a colossus, 
in his cuirassier's uniform affecting a military stiffness dry and cold in speech champion of brute force proud of the ascendancy given to him by six weeks of brilliant victories and the investment of paris the other slender delicate of refined bearing inconspicuous in his civilian dress speaking with the emotion of an advocate pleading a noble cause believing in humanity justice and right his own conviction alone sustained him for what did he represent a government which was scarce fifteen days old and a conquered country but this country was france the cause was a beautiful one to plead and he pleaded it with his whole soul how was it possible that they should understand each other jules favre spoke in the name of sentiment in bismarck's policy that policy of realities there was never a place for sentiment between jules favre and bismarck there were three interviews on the nineteenth and the twentieth of september the first at the chateau de la haute maison the two others in the chateau de ferrieres belonging to baron rothschild bismarck knew ferrieres he had hunted there in eighteen sixty five jules favre asked for an armistice for the convocation of an assembly with which prussia could treat bismarck would hear nothing of an armistice at any price he spoke of alsace strasbourg is a perpetual menace to us it is the key of our house and we want it during the last interview bismarck consented to say on what conditions an armistice might be granted germany would occupy all the vosges fortresses and mont valerian at the gates of paris the elections for a national assembly were not to take place either in alsace or in the part of lorraine germany kept for herself jules favre was profoundly moved his eyes filled with tears according to bismarck who was incapable of understanding such emotion jules favre was simply playing a part two days later a letter from jules favre informed the chancellor that france could not agree to the conditions demanded of her for an armistice the interviews at ferrieres had been in french because as bismarck told jules favre they had no official character he added on the day when we sign the treaty of peace you'll see we shall speak german on the fifth of october the german headquarters were established at versailles bismarck installed himself in the house of madame jesse vingt-quatre rue de provence it was his residence for five months up to the beginning of the month of march he turned this house into a sort of branch of the wilhelmstrasse having with him his confidential assistants abeken coitel lothar bucher and maurice bush he kept up his usual way of life getting up late but working in his study till far on in the night great eater and drinker as he was he lived in abundance at versailles presents of eatables came to him from all parts of germany hampers of game pheasants fish monumental pieces of pastry bottles of beer and wine dainties of all sorts but the parisians were dying of cold and hunger the drawing-room of the jesse house witnessed a constant stream of politicians at times they heard the sternest of speeches such as bismarck made one day to the mayor of versailles germany wants peace and will make war until she obtains it whatever may be the deplorable consequences for humanity should france even disappear like carthage and other ancient nations the constitution of the german empire the capitulation of paris the preliminaries of peace were all signed in that historic room on the table there was a clock surmounted by a head of satan this diabolical figure presided over all these events it seems bismarck did not take it away with him when he departed while he was staying at the chateau de ferrieres bismarck had received an ambiguous personage called Renier, 
who introduced himself as an emissary of the empress and attempted for some time to play the part of intermediary between the prussian headquarters and the army of metz at versailles the chancellor saw a personage of another sort appear general boyer chief aide-de-camp de, de bazaine who engaged him in diplomatic discussions which came to no end for it was a question of the army of metz being still the army of the empire resolved to support the government of the regent but this last took days and during those days metz was dying of hunger since the day of saint privat frederick charles had strictly blockaded the capital of lorraine from versailles bismarck followed and hastened the agony of the heroic city on the twenty seventh of october bazaine gave up to germany metz la pucelle and an intact army of a hundred and seventy five thousand men shortly afterwards under these desperate circumstances on the twenty first of november Thiers presented himself at the house in the rue de provence bismarck has written with singular saint gene of this good servant of his country he is he says an amiable and clever man witty and brilliant but he is not a diplomatist he's too sentimental he is incontestably more shrewd than jules favre but he too lets himself be too easily bluffed i can pump him as much as i like and then he has a regrettable folly he drags out the negotiations with which he is charged by introducing matters that have nothing to do with them the future liberator of the land came to beg for an armistice which would allow of the convocation of a national assembly with which the question of peace could be discussed the negotiations between thiers and bismarck lasted five days and were without result as at the ferrier interview the chancellor had again spoken of the occupation of one of the paris forts he would not permit the election in alsace and lorraine nor authorize the revictualling of paris thiers debated these conditions inch by inch the only alternative he could obtain was either the armistice without revictualling or the election without the armistice the government of national defence directed thiers to break off negotiations which had no result during the course of the siege of paris bismarck's diplomacy was suddenly drawn to affairs in the east on the thirty first of october the chancellor gortschakoff addressed a circular letter to the signatory powers of the treaty of eighteen fifty six asking for the revision of the articles which limited the russian forces on the black sea in london and vienna there was a lively sense of ill-humour in paris there were other things to do than to utter a platonic protest bismarck remembered that the part prussia had played in the polish insurrection of eighteen sixty five had won him the friendship of russia and that this friendship had left him elbow room in the war of eighteen sixty six and in the present war therefore it was to his interest to husband this precious friendship all the more because the question of the black sea had then but very distant relations with the policy of prussia he proposed to refer the question to an international conference russia very willingly agreed and england and austria consented the conference opened in london on the seventeenth of january at a time when france was unable to take part in it the convention of london of the fourteenth of march eighteen seventy one gave russia entire liberty of action on the black sea bismarck and gortschakoff had each about the same time carried through an excellent transaction one concerning strasbourg and metz the other sebastopol but bismarck in his house at versailles was pursuing with untiring tenacity the transformation of the confederation of northern germany 
into an empire comprising all the German states. To overcome the final hesitation of some of the German states, what could be better than to crush France, if not by taking Paris? From a military point of view, this operation seemed impossible, at least by destroying her. The Chancellor was one of those who were exasperated by the resistance of Paris. He shared the sentiments of his wife, who was always filled, he said, with a rabid hatred of the French, all of whom, down to the little children, she would like to see shot and cut to pieces. Early in November she wrote to him, I am going soon to send you the book of Psalms, so that you may read the prophecy against the French. I say unto you, the impious must be exterminated. After the rupture of negotiations at the beginning of November, the question of the bombardment of Paris came up perpetually in the Chancellor's conversations. I know, he said, that several papers make me responsible for Paris not being yet bombarded. It is absurd. From the first, I asked that the capital should be destroyed from top to bottom. But the military authorities are forever shuffling. I spend my time in overcoming their scruples, and they spend theirs in making preparations and begging for an increase of munitions. He spoke to the king on the matter, who declared that he had given the order to the generals. But I understood at once, added Bismarck, that this was not true. I knew him. He doesn't know how to lie, or anyhow, how to set about it. Behind these delays in beginning of the bombardment, Bismarck guessed at the influence of a feminine cabal. It is the Queen of England, he said, who does not wish Paris to be bombarded. She has influenced her daughter, the Princess Royal, who in her turn has influenced her husband, the Crown Prince. One day, when Bismarck wanted to speak of the bombardment to the Crown Prince, the latter stopped him with these words, I should prefer to give up my command. The Chancellor was on the point of answering, I am ready to take it. I should give but one order. It would be, begin the bombardment. On the 27th of December, Bismarck's diabolical wishes were granted. The bombardment began. On the 12th of January, it was reported at Versailles that Paris was on fire. Great columns of smoke on the horizon could be seen over the capital. That's not enough, said the Chancellor. We ought to be able to smell the reek here. Bismarck's sense of smell was like that of Vitellius, who on the field of battle of Bedriacum said that the corpse of an enemy always smelled good. On the afternoon of the 2nd of September, when visiting the battlefield of Sedan, passing Bazeille, he had smelt with a mixture of disgust and pleasure a strong smell of burnt onions, and had said, these burning Frenchmen. The first shells of the bombardment fell on the Avron Plateau. On the 5th of January they began to fall on the town itself. The Panthéon, the Val de Grasse, the museum, served as targets to the German batteries. Then Bismarck's delight broke forth. At last they have begun to fire, he wrote to his wife in a cry of savage joy. On the 19th of January, the day after the proclamation at Versailles of the German Empire, the garrison of Paris had made a supreme effort on the side of Montretout and Bouzonval. They had been unable to get through and had left on the battlefield 1,200 dead and 4,000 wounded. Trochu sent to ask for an armistice of 48 hours to carry away the wounded and bury the dead. Bismarck sent a refusal, and besides, he added, the dead are just as comfortable above the ground as underneath it. Jules Favre presented himself at the Chancellor's house at seven o'clock in the evening of the 25th of January. He had grown paler and stouter, said Bismarck to a confidant. It is no doubt the effect of eating horse flesh. The conversation between the two men lasted over two and a half hours. Then Bismarck went to William and talked to him for three-quarters of an hour, coming back afterwards to his intimates in the dining-room. He was radiant, and turning to his cousin, Count Bismarck Bolin, 
Do you know this? he asked, and he began to whistle the call of the hunter who has brought down a stag. Yes, said Bolin, it is the death signal. No, not quite that, and again he whistled. But at any rate, I believe this time it's all right. Jules Favre had come to treat of the capitulation of Paris. Shells had had no effect on the great city, but famine had accomplished its death stroke. Paris without meat, without coal, and nothing left but surrender. Jules Favre had said that in Paris one saw ladies taking pretty children to walk on the boulevard. That surprises me, said the gentle chancellor. You haven't eaten them all, then. On the 28th of January, after five days of very painful negotiations for Jules Favre, and the generals who accompanied him, an armistice of twenty-one days was arranged for the electing and convocation of a national assembly. As to the army of the East, the perfidy of Bismarck, who wanted Belfort at any price, fooled Jules Favre's ignorance by showing him an inaccurate line of demarcation of the armies, so that the entire army of the East was excluded from the armistice, and was obliged to continue its disastrous retreat, and after worse sufferings to retire into Swiss territory. On the eve of the signature, the cannon from Mont Valerian was heard for the last time. Paris had capitulated. The National Assembly had met at Bordeaux and had elected Thiers as head of the executive. On the 21st of February, Thiers went to Versailles, to settle the preliminaries of peace. He knew that Bismarck's conditions would be very severe, but he was determined to debate them to the last extremity and to cope with the Chancellor. Though saying to Thiers that he did not want to jockey him, Bismarck laid down his exigent terms. All Alsace, including Belfort, German Lorraine, with Metz, an indemnity of six milliard francs, the entry of the German troops into Paris. The negotiations lasted till the 26th of February. Jules Favre had accompanied Thiers, but it was the latter who bore the whole weight of the discussion. No, he said, I will never give up Belfort and Metz. You wish to ruin France financially, to ruin her on her frontiers. Very well, take her, ravage her, destroy her houses, flay her unoffending inhabitants, we will fight to our last breath. You will have to govern her in the sight of Europe, if it allows you. Bismarck fell back upon the unalterable conditions of the king in Maltka, but there was one point upon which he himself was determined never to come to terms, which was the acquisition of Lorraine with Metz. Gorchakov had written to advise him to leave German Lorraine and Metz to France, and he had answered the Russian chancellor with these words. We must keep strictly to the program that six months ago we communicated to St. Petersburg. The realization of this program is indispensable for our security, and Germany would not for one instant tolerate the alteration of even a comma. We must have Metz and Lorraine. The discussions between Thiers and Bismarck were at times stormy. One day, at some fresh exaction of the Chancellor's, T.A. started up and exclaimed, But that is an insult. Bismarck went on with the conversation in German. Do you know, said T.A., that I don't know German? Bismarck answered in French, Why, just now you spoke of an insult. I found that I did not know enough French, and so I preferred to speak German, in which I understand what I say and especially what I mean. But Bismarck had obtained an indemnity of five milliards and the cession of Metz, so he consented to a compromise. Which do you prefer, he said suddenly one day, Belfort or the renunciation of our entry into Paris? Belfort, answered Thiers, Paris is ready to drink the cup to the dregs, to preserve for the country a corner of her soil and an heroic city. The valiant citadel which Donfort Rochereau had not ceased defending until the 16th of February, when the order had come to him from the French government, 
was preserved for France. The unvanquished defenders of Belfort left the place before the German troops who presented arms. Thiers had saved this scrap of Alsatian ground, and once more, since 1914, the impregnable citadel bars the way of the invader, who, thanks to it, has been unable to penetrate into Burgundy. The preliminaries of peace were signed at Versailles on the 26th of February. Bismarck, then, was willing to lay aside for the moment his haughty tone. He took Thiers's hands and said, I understand and honor your sorrow. I am the minister of Prussia, you the minister of France. I had to do what I have done. As early as the 17th of February, before the opening of the negotiations at Versailles, the deputies of Alsace-Lorraine had, from the tribune at Bordeaux, spoken the solemn protest drawn up by Gambetta, deputy of the Barin. It had been read by Emile Keller, deputy of the Haut-Rhin. Here are a few lines from this most touching document. The two eastern provinces owe to it that they have kept, as a right, their French character. We call our fellow citizens of France, the governments and peoples of the whole world, to witness that we hold beforehand as null and void all acts or treaties, votes or plebiscites, which may consent to give over to the foreigner the whole or part of our provinces of Alsace and Lorraine. By these presents we proclaim for ever the inviolable right of the Alsatians and Lorrainers to remain members of the French nation, and we swear for ourselves and our constituents, our children and their descendants, to claim it for evermore and in every way against all usurpers. On the 1st of March, the Assembly of Bordeaux, compelled, as Thiers said, to bow its head beneath the power of the foreigners, ratified the Versailles preliminaries. Then a deputy of the Haut-Rhin once more entered a supreme protest. Given over, in defiance of all justice, and by an odious abuse of strength, to the domination of the foreigner, we have a last duty to perform. Once more we declare null and void a pact which disposes of us without our consent. Your brothers of Alsace and Lorraine, now separated from the common family, will keep for France, absent from their hearthstone, a filial affection until the day when she will come to take up once again her place there. The rapidity with which T.A. had made the assembly ratify the peace preliminaries had this fortunate consequence, that the French government was able to obtain from the morning of the 3rd of March, the evacuation of Paris. On the 1st, William I had reviewed the German troops on the Longchamp racecourse. Bismarck was on horseback. There was some hissing as he went by. In the evening, he told how he had asked a very disagreeable-looking man for a light for his cigar, and that, without a word, the man had held out his cigarette to him. A solemn entry of the guard had been arranged for the 3rd of March, but the night before, after the notice Jules Favre had hastened to give, it had become impossible, and in fact it did not take place. On the 6th of March, Bismarck and the great general staff left Versailles. On the 9th, after being absent seven months, the victors re-entered Berlin. On the 16th of June, the day of the solemn entry of the German troops into Berlin, there could be seen on the front of the Royal Academy a portrait of Bismarck with this inscription, Forged by fire, cemented with blood, unity is fashioned, braving the storms of time, master, thou hast kept thy word, meister, du löses dein Wort. The preliminaries of Versailles had now to be turned into a treaty of peace. A Franco-German conference for this end was open at Brussels on the 24th of March, but the insurrection of the Commune and the unreasonable demands of Germany prevented its coming to a decision. Bismarck 
then decided to treat directly at Frankfurt with two plenipotentiaries, Jules Favre and Pouillet Cartier. The latter, who was then finance minister, brought to these final negotiations a practical knowledge of affairs and a frankness of manner, not to speak of a stomach that could stand German grossness, which helped greatly to settle the final difficulties. Alas, nothing of the preliminaries of the 26th of February could be altered. The negotiations at Frankfurt began at the Swan Hotel on the 6th of May. Four days were spent in painful discussions. Our plenipotentiaries had to make some further concessions, notably as to the condition of the payment of the five milliards and of the position of the Alsace-Lorrainers. The final signatures were exchanged on the 10th of May, 1871. Bismarck had the right to congratulate himself on the Treaty of Frankfurt for the deed of violence which he had had in his mind for so long had become a reality. By iron and fire he had torn from France two pieces of her flesh. Nevertheless, how could he doubt the invincible affection the Alsatians and Lorrainers had for France. Had not these Frenchmen protested before the whole world against the violence done to their bodies to which their hearts would never submit? The Chancellor knew well that there would be a difficult time to get through. He estimated it at about thirty years. At the end of thirty years, the resignation of the annexed peoples and the ascent of France ought to allow Germany to enjoy her brutal conquest in peace. Those thirty years are long past. It will soon be a half-century since that iniquitous deed was done. Far from disappearing, the gulf Bismarck made between France and Germany has become deeper and deeper. There is but one way of filling it up, that the crime of 1871 be atoned for. France did not wish for the present war. She suffers cruelly from it, but she endures her sufferings with courage, for she knows that the hour is near, the hour of vengeance and liberation, which, from the cathedrals of Strasbourg and Metz, from the belfries of Alsace and Lorraine, will ring in the victory of indefeasible right. Then at last France will have the joy of being at home. How eloquently did a venerable orator speak forty-six years ago of invaded France, of the happiness of belonging to oneself? And I, he said, who have seen these beautiful fields, those green hills, those charming rivers, formerly the eastern frontiers, and now the land of the stranger, when I think of the beautiful picture of my own country, as I knew it in my youth, and as it is still with me in dreams, before my eyes, when I think of the gloom, the encroachments of the enemy, and that the soil is no longer ours, that even there, where it still belongs to us in word, it is forced to suffer the presence of the foreigner. Ah, monsieur, it is hard for a man who loves his country. Well do I know the cry, that then breaks forth from the patriotic heart. There is but one, vehement as the roar of a lion. It is the cry of deliverance. Let us release our country and be at home. End of Section 8Section 9 of Bismarck by Georges Lacour Gaillet. Translated by M. Harriet M. Capes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 5 The German Empire. Part 1. The victories of Prussia in 1870 did not result only in the theft of two French provinces they had another result which Bismarck had been seeking since 1866, the renaissance of the German Empire. On the 18th of January, in the Galerie des Glaces at Versailles, 
This was an accomplished fact. But before coming to a proclamation of the empire, the chancellor had many difficulties to solve. The crown prince went beyond Bismarck's ideas. He was a partisan of the national unity of Germany, but in the sense in which it had been understood by the men of 1848. That is to say, with really liberal and parliamentary institutions, which would have the effect of putting the nation itself and not the princes in the foreground. No doubt, as Bismarck wrote in his contemptuous style, his royal highness had taken the idea from one of the political visionaries to whom he lent an ear. As for William I, he by no means shared his son's liberalism. He held that the title of King of Prussia was superior to all others. He understood a Prussia with increased territory, but he was not anxious to exchange, for the title of Emperor, that of President of the Confederation, which he had borne since 1866. Bismarck declared that the adoption of the title of Emperor was a political necessity. Your Majesty, he said to his master, does not want to remain forever a neuter noun, das Presidium, there is something abstract about the word president. The name of emperor, on the contrary, possesses great strength and power. That might be true, but the imperial title was unknown in Prussian institutions, and Frederick the Second had made the name of King of Prussia so powerful that there was no need to change it, even by modifying the territorial form of Germany. He had also to reckon with the particularism, if not the anti-Prussian sentiments, of the southern states, especially Bavaria. They had certainly associated their armies with those of Prussia at the beginning of the war, and had taken a large part in the common victory. Still, they did not intend to join the federal constitution without getting any advantages. King Louis of Bavaria showed himself the most refractory, yet he was the sovereign it was most necessary to win over because of his preponderant position in southern Germany. Delbruck, one of Bismarck's best agents, was employed by him in negotiations with the southern states which were very knotty. It will be enough here to state the broad results. On the 2nd of September, the very evening of the capitulation of Sedan, the Grand Duke of Baden sent a note to Prussia asking, with the entrance of the Grand Duchy into the Confederation of the North, the re-establishment of the imperial title. The ancient title of Emperor, borne by the Habsburgs, had gone down in the territorial confusion which followed Austerlitz. The new title, restored by the Hohenzollerns, was to be borne as the result of the great victory Germany had just won. This double request of the Baden government corresponded with Bismarck's most ardent wishes, but in public opinion it perhaps lost something of its worth because the Grand Duke Frederick was the son-in-law of the King of Prussia. More significant was the action of Bavaria. Towards the middle of September, the cabinet at Munich had renewed on its own account the proposals of the Karlsruhe cabinet qualified by diverse conditions. At that time, Delbruck's diplomacy was very active about the southern courts and rendered the greatest services to the cause of unity. At the end of September, he wrote, the German Union is assured. But the birth of unity still needed many laborious weeks. The delegates of Württemberg, Baden, Bavaria, and Hesse arrived at Versailles at the end of October and serious discussions began. It was a very hard-working period of the Chancellor's stay in the hotel in the Rue de Provence. The negotiations with Thiers concerning the armistice 
the negotiations with Russia about the Black Sea, the negotiations with the delegates of the princes about the constitution of a new Germany were conducted simultaneously. He wrote to his wife that it was galley slave work, my ink smearers maneuver and intrigue night and day after the fashion of Frankfurt. Unless a German hurricane falls upon them one of these days, we shall arrive at nothing with these diplomats and bureaucrats of the old school anyhow this year. The Alsace-Lorraine question awakened envy and jealousy in the southern states. To whom was this land torn from France to belong? To cut short all rivalry, Bismarck engaged that it should belong to no one, no more to Prussia, who in fact had conquered it, than to the Grand Duchy of Baden, which in virtue of its nearness hoped to annex a portion. It would belong to all, since it was the fruit of a campaign in which all Germans had participated under the title of Reichsland, that is, the land of the empire. It would be the property of the entire new Germany. The two French provinces would thus become, as it were, the keystone of the united work. During the course of November, Baden, Hesse, and Württemberg passed treaties for their entrance into the Confederation. But the great success was gained on the 23rd of November. On that day, Bismarck had had a lengthy conference with the three Bavarian plenipotentiaries. Then the door opened, and he appeared, looking radiant, an empty glass in his hand. Gentlemen, he said, the treaty with Bavaria is signed. The unity of Germany is assured and our king becomes the emperor of Germany. Bring another bottle. It is a great event. The newspapers won't be satisfied. Perhaps even the men who write history will criticize our treaty. Speaking of me, he will say, that idiot ought to have asked for more. He would have got it, because they would have been obliged to give it him. He who will say that will perhaps be right, but he will not take into account that what I attached the most importance to was that my partners should be pleased with me. Treaties are worth nothing when those who sign them do it under constraint or force. All comment is superfluous, but it is well to compare this edifying declaration with the memory of the Frankfurt Treaties in 1871 and that of Bucharest in 1918. As for me, I see that those people have gone away satisfied. I did not try to take them in. The crown prince was one of those who thought that under the circumstances Prussia might have obtained greater advantages from Bavaria. That is true, answered the chancellor. We might have asked for more. But what could we have done to gain it? Well, we could have done it by force. In that case, sir, I can only advise your royal highness to begin by disarming the Bavarian troops you have under your command. Contrary to what had taken place in 1849, it was now the princes who had made German unity, and there was the need to get it ratified, if not by the people, at least by their representatives. The Reichstag was convoked for this end. Several deputies found the conditions under which Württemberg and still more Bavaria entered into the Confederation, or rather the Empire, far from satisfactory. But the astute Delbruck, admirably interpreting his chief's ideas, was able to throw the fullest light on the advantages of the new regime. A delegation of thirty deputies was then sent by the Reichstag from Berlin to Versailles to beg the King of Prussia to accept the imperial crown. In 1849, a delegation of 32 deputies had come from Frankfurt to Berlin to Frederick William IV with the same object. Oddly enough, the delegation of 1870 had the same president as that of 1849. This was Simpson, who was at this time president of the Reichstag, 
as twenty-one years earlier he had been president at Frankfurt. But the analogy was purely superficial, for according to a saying of the time, between 1849 and 1870, Bismarck, Rune, and Moltke had come along. On the 18th of December, the delegates were received at Versailles in the great hall of the prefecture. Simpson was much moved in reading the address, as was William I in reading his speech, which had been composed by Bismarck. All the time the ceremony lasted, the firing of the batteries on Mont Valerian could be heard. Before the arrival of the Reichstag delegation, Bismarck had achieved his end. He had induced Ludwig II of Bavaria to take the initiative in the matter of the revival of the empire. He had written to him, In my opinion, it is of the highest importance that the first suggestion should come from your majesty, and not from the representatives of the people. The situation would be strained if the initiative were not freely and maturely considered to be that of the most powerful of the confederated princes. In answer, the king of Bavaria consented to forsake his misanthropy for the moment and to forget the embellishment of his castles so far as to address a letter to William I on the 2nd of December. I have proposed to the German princes, he said, to join with me in asking your majesty that the exercise of the presidential rights of the confederation be made under the title of German emperor. German unity and the empire were therefore going to be constituted with the character that Bismarck desired above all things to impress upon them. It was the princes themselves who made themselves the interpreters of Germany's wish for unity. William had now only to hold out his hand to take the imperial crown, but he still hesitated, for his love of Prussia outweighed his love of Germany, and the title of King of Prussia still seemed to him the most beautiful of all. If he may be believed, he thought for a moment of abdicating and leaving everything to Fritz. At last, on the 14th of January, he let it be known that he accepted the new dignity with the firm intention of being, by the grace of God, as a German prince, the faithful protector of all rights and of holding the sword of Germany for the protection of our country. The coronation ceremony was fixed for the 18th of January, for that day is the anniversary of a date famous in the history of the Hohenzollern dynasty at Königsberg, on the 18th of January, 1701, the all-powerful Prince Frederick I had crowned himself and been anointed as King of Prussia, and the Order of the Black Eagle had been instituted to perpetuate the memory of that coronation. On the eve of the great day, the King, the Crown Prince, and Bismarck had a lengthy conversation to settle the final details of the protocol. A serious discussion arose over even the title of the new emperor. Should he be emperor of Germany or German emperor? The title of emperor of Germany seemed to imply territorial powers, and for this reason William stood out for it, even to the extent of saying that he would be emperor of Germany or no emperor at all. For this same reason, Bavaria would not consent to this. Bismarck strove to convince his master that the only suitable title was German Emperor, Deutscher Kaiser, as one said, Imperator Romanus. He held as obstinately to his idea as William did to his. The Grand Duke of Baden discovered an ingenious way of getting out of the difficulty the next day at the proclamation of the empire. It was to use neither one title nor the other. On the 18th of January, 1871, the Castle of Versailles witnessed the display of official pomp at the coronation. In the Hall of Mirrors, that gallery which Madame de Sévigné called a royal beauty unique in the world, beneath the paintings of Lebrun 
that glorify the triumphs of Louis the Fourteenth, an altar was set up in the middle against the windows looking over the park. Round about the altar stood the king, the members of the royal family, the princes, the officers, the ministers, all laced up and girded into their Germanic stiffness. The ceremony began with a religious service, and then William made a short speech, thanking the illustrious princes and allies, and telling them that in response to their request, he accepted for himself and his successors the German imperial dignity. Then Bismarck, who wore the white uniform of the cuirassiers, read the proclamation addressed by His Majesty to the German people, which said, We accept the imperial dignity in the hope that the German people may be permitted to enjoy the reward of its zealous and heroic struggles in a durable peace, protected by frontiers capable of assuring to the fatherland, by security against fresh attacks from France, that of which it has been deprived for centuries. Finally, the Grand Duke of Baden, who took the place of the absent King of Bavaria, gave a hoch in honour of the Emperor, long live his imperial majesty the emperor william those present repeated these words three times and william walked past all the groups the ceremony was finished the empire was made but no one knew yet whether his chief was emperor of germany or german emperor his majesty relates the chancellor was so greatly put out with me by the way that things had gone, that coming down from the raised platform of the princes, he pretended not to see me, though I stood alone in the open space in front of the platform, and passing before me, he went and gave his hand to the general standing behind me. The strange attitude of the emperor with regard to the chancellor on this solemn occasion could alter nothing in history. A man had had the determined will to respond to the aspirations for unity of the german people but to respond in his own way igne et ferro and giving only formal concessions to popular rights he had forcibly turned austria out of germany's door from eighteen sixty six it was all up with the old dualism the hohenzollerns remained alone at the head of the germanic body it was now left to give the king of prussia the prestige of victories that would raise him to the first rank in europe and in germany do away with the last hesitations the war with france had allowed this end to be reached in unhoped-for circumstances diplomacy had completed the work of victory all the princes and states of germany had grouped themselves around william i and saluted him with the title of emperor the artisan of this great work, the man who had directed everything, made everything succeed, was the iron-fisted minister who, since 1862, had ruled all the policy of Prussia. This German empire, which he had himself just proclaimed in the castle of Versailles, in a voice vibrating with joy, as was said by one present, might and did answer a national wish, but it was, above all, the fruit of Bismarckian genius, and it bore unmistakably the imprint of its author. The first Reichstag of the Empire was elected in the month of March, 1871. After a short debate, it accepted the imperial constitution, which was only a sort of reproduction of the federal constitution of 1867. Fourteen votes opposed any modification of the Constitution. Therefore, Prussia, with its 17 votes, remained mistress of the Federal Compact. The new regime came officially into force on the 16th of April. A month later, the Treaty of Frankfurt was signed. Then William conferred the hereditary title of Prince on the minister who had done such great things, giving him besides the Duchy of Lauenburg. On this land, taken from Denmark in 1864, Bismarck was to make the great domain of Friedrichsruh, 
There he was to spend his last years, and there he was to die. Bismarck was, for nineteen years, up to 1890, to preside over the interior and foreign policy of the new Germany. His chief aim, then, was to consolidate the edifice he had built in 1871, and consequently his doings lost a little of the aggressive brutality that had characterized them at an earlier period, but the Iron Chancellor, in his relations with his adversaries at home and abroad, always remained a man of overbearing manners. Since 1871, the whole foreign policy of Germany, and one may add, of the greater number of European states, has been dominated by the Alsace-Lorraine question. The regime of our armed peace, the grouping of the European states in two allied bodies, the present war itself, were all consequences of the violence done in 1871 to two French provinces. France was vanquished, mutilated. She had had to pay a ransom of five milliards. Nevertheless, she still caused Bismarck enough fears to make him strive to isolate her in Europe. The isolation of France was for Germany the best guarantee that she might enjoy the fruits of her theft, and that the vengeance of the vanquished might perhaps cease to be a menace to her. The insurrection of Poland in 1863, the wars of 1866 and 1870, the Black Sea question had for some years past brought about an exchange of good offices between Berlin and St. Petersburg, and the relations between the two governments became closer after personal visits. In 1871, the Chancellor Gorchakov and then the Tsar Alexander II came in person to Berlin. Between the Chancellors and the Sovereigns, there were several conferences when they talked of the peace which had been so hardly won and the benefit that would come from maintaining it. Not only did Austria retain no ill feeling as to the memories of 1866, but she had just eagerly recognized the Imperial Germany of 1871. In his turn, Bismarck came to Gostein. He does not say if he had the opportunity of seeing there, as in 1863, a nest of tomtits, and noting how many times in a minute the bird brought a caterpillar or some other insect to his little ones. He had frequent interviews with Herr von Beust, the former Saxon minister who now became Chancellor of Austria-Hungary. The two former rivals had completely forgotten the past. The sole question was the establishment of excellent relations between Germany and Austria. Bismarck had just made the first advances. The following year he reaped the benefit. In the month of September, 1872, Berlin witnessed the arrival of the emperors Alexander and Francis Joseph. There was a whole week of official fetes. Between Bismarck and Andrassy, the new president of the Austro-Hungarian Council, a very intimate agreement was set up. Andrassy, as a Magyar, greatly pleased Bismarck, who counted on using him to shift Austrian policy to the east as the best means of turning it away from Germany. Between Bismarck and Gorchakov, who were mutually jealous, some misunderstandings arose, not to mention that the Tsar and the Russian statesmen did not conceal their sympathy with the French ambassador, the Vicomte de Gantobiron, but these little unpleasantnesses escaped the attention of most of those present. Moreover, the interview of the three emperors was regarded as the most significant manifestation of German greatness. Berlin appeared to have become the diplomatic capital of Europe. Countenanced by the goodwill of Russia and the marked sympathy of Austria-Hungary, Bismarck's actions ceased to be purely German and took on a European character. Russia had a very special attraction for William. From Versailles, 
he had sent to Alexander II the famous telegram, After God, it is to you we owe our victory. In 1875, he travelled to St. Petersburg, accompanied by Bismarck and Moltke, in order to return Alexander's visit. The Tsar received his friend from Berlin with extraordinary pomp, wishing his reception to be worthy of the meeting of the two masters of the world. In September 1873, Victor Emmanuel I came to Berlin in his turn to greet the victor of Sidon. The visit of the King of Italy did not end for the moment in a diplomatic agreement, but it was certain that the isolation of France was drawing nearer and nearer. Why had Alsace-Lorraine been torn from France? As we have already seen, Bismarck, with a frankness, or rather a cynicism, to which there is no answer, during the course of the campaign in France, had many times given the reason. He was in no wise concerned about pretended historic rights. That thesis, as pedantic as false, had not yet been invented. It was a question, purely and simply, of military reasons. The western frontier of Germany must be protected, and to that end must absorb Strasbourg and Metz. After the Treaty of Frankfurt, he went on saying and repeating it, a conversation with the Marquis Gabriac and several speeches which he made from the Reichstag Tribune furnish sufficient proofs of this. The Marquis de Gabriac had been charged by Thiers to resume, as chargé d'affaires at Berlin, diplomatic relations between the Wilhelmstrasse and the Quai d'Orsay. The task would be difficult and painful. On his arrival at Parisa Platz on the 4th of July, 1871, he had inaugurated his office by incurring the lively displeasure of the Chancellor on the subject of a plan for a military and financial convention which the French government had attempted to negotiate with General Manteuffel without reference to the German chargé d'affaires at Paris. On this subject, on the 12th of August, 1871, Bismarck had an interview with Gabriac, which lasted two hours. The latter reported it in detail in a long letter to M. de Rémusat, Minister of Foreign Affairs. Word for word, the Chancellor had said, It would be scarcely logical to take mess, which is French from you, if imperious necessity did not oblige us to keep it. On principle, I should not have wished to keep that town for Germany. When the question was gone into before the Emperor, the staff asked me if I could guarantee that France would not take her revenge some day or other. I replied that, on the contrary, I was quite convinced that she would, and that this war would probably not be the last that would break out between the two countries. In that case, they said to me, Metz is a glacis behind which a hundred thousand men might be placed. Therefore, we ought to keep it. I will say as much of Alsace and Lorraine. If peace were to be lasting, we should have made a mistake in taking them from you. But for us, those provinces will be a difficulty. Monsieur de Gabriac answered, A Venezia, with France at its back? Yes, said the Chancellor, a Venezia, with France at its back. On this subject, the Marquis de Gabriac has recorded the profound impression Prince Bismarck made on him. I found his special superiority, he says, to lie in his fighting powers, his absolute disdain of reticence, his habit of getting from the very first to the bottom of the question he was discussing, the haughty frankness of his declarations, his speech, a little slow at first, but vigorous and rapid so soon as he felt any emotion, took me into a world quite other than that in which I have negotiated up to now. With Monsieur de Bismarck, one felt that each one of his ideas or words 
might be interpreted as an act of government. It was a master rather than a minister before whom I stood. I seemed to see Arminius on the morrow of the disaster of the Roman legions receiving the envoys of the vanquished people. Among the official speeches Bismarck made from the tribune of the Reichstag on the Alsace-Lorraine question, one of the most important was that of May 2, 1871, when the bill concerning the annexation of Alsace-Lorraine by the Germanic Empire was first under discussion. Let us hear him speak. Several times, he said, we have been told that we might be satisfied with the costs of the war and the demolition of the fortresses of Alsace and Lorraine. I have always rejected this solution because I did not consider it likely to maintain peace. To establish servitude on foreign soil is to create a very heavy burden on the sentiment of sovereignty and independence of the country on which it is laid. Another way, and one which had partisans even among the inhabitants of Alsace, would have been to form, out of the two provinces of Alsace and Lorraine, a neutral state, like Belgium and Switzerland. In this case, there would have been, from the North Sea to the Swiss Alps, a chain of neutral states, which no doubt would have made it impossible for us to attack France, but the protection of which would have made it easy for France to disembark troops on our northern coasts. Moreover, the neutrality of a state can be maintained only if the population of that state be resolved to keep up a neutral attitude. In Alsace and Lorraine, where the population remains linked to France by its interests, its sympathies, and its memories, neutrality would have been but a snare for us in a new Franco-German war. There was, therefore, but one thing to do, purely and simply, to submit those countries with their strong fortresses to German domination in our turn, to use them as a glacis for Germany against France, and so to put back by some stages the starting point for French attacks, if France, grown strong again or supported by allies, once more threw down the gauntlet to us. In this same speech of the 2nd of May, 1871, the Chancellor clearly stated that Alsace-Lorraine was above all an instrument for the unification of Germany. A confederation, he said, composed of sovereign princes and free towns, making the conquest of a country, which for its own safety it is obliged to keep, but which thus becomes a possession common to all the participants, that is a thing very rare in its way. That definition of Alsace-Lorraine must be kept in mind, a possession common to all the participants. That was to state clearly that the cohesion of the empire had been largely made by the complicity of all in the crime committed against France. As a good pupil of the cynic, Frederick II, Bismarck came to banter his victims. It was to some notable, I know not who, of Hesse or Hanover, that he said, to console him for having become Prussian against his will, Prussia, you see, is like a flannel waistcoat. It scratches unpleasantly at first, but it's wholesome, and it sticks to the skin well. At least he spared the French of Strasbourg and Metz his ill-bred jokes, for he had no doubt of the depth of their fidelity to France. Naturally, he said in April 1872, there was a great number of people in Alsace-Lorraine who wished to preserve French nationality and refused to become Germans. We foresaw that, but we were obliged to take that strip of earth to protect ourselves, always the same leitmotif, 
against the incursions of freebooters which for two hundred years france had sent against us it goes without saying that we could not authorize those who elected for french nationality to remain in alsace lorraine because then every one would elect for france in eighteen seventy three the government laid before the reichstag a statement as to the legislation and administration of alsace lorraine during the year eighteen seventy two eighteen seventy three this gave the chancellor the opportunity to return again to his subject so painful for our brothers and us so troublesome for the people of germany here are some passages from his speech of the sixteenth of may eighteen seventy three it is not from a mania for possessing territories and men nor for the legitimate desire to redress an ancient wrong two hundred years old but from the hard necessity of expecting fresh attacks from a warlike country that we have extended our demands for the cession of territory and fortresses as far as is the case so that we may have a bulwark behind which we may await further attacks similar to those that each generation in germany has suffered from during three centuries doubt our cleverness for we officials of northern germany and especially we prussians are not celebrated for our clever ways of gaining friends or doing disagreeable things in an amiable fashion doubt our cleverness then but do not doubt our devotion our good will our courage our steadfast resolve to show an unshaken front to all the enemies of the empire on the third of march eighteen seventy four when a new administrative regime had been acting for two months in the reichlan bismarck again took up the word on the alsace lorrainers i have already said that we did not flatter ourselves that we should succeed quickly in making them happy neither was it for that reason that we made the annexation we have built a rampart against the eruptions that for two hundred years a passionate and warlike people have made on us a people to whom germany has the misfortune and discomfort of being the only neighbor in europe directly exposed in face of this bellicose people we have to break the point of wissenburg which dug deep into our flesh and it is precisely that point of alsace which is inhabited by a part of the ex-french population that vies with the gaul in the passion for war and in a veritable germanic hatred of the germanic race the empire country or reichsland was first of all subjected to an exceptional regime if it was one state the more bringing up the states of the empire to twenty-six it was not an autonomous state enjoying like the others the right of self-administration a veritable dictatorship organized by bismarck began on the morrow of the treaty of frankfort to weigh down alsace lorraine the two provinces were given over to a swarm of officials all germans the use of the french language in official documents was forbidden sentences of fines and imprisonment were pitilessly inflicted on those and they were legion against whom the german government thought it had cause for complaint the introduction of german military service in eighteen seventy two was an opportunity for fresh severity it was then that a great number of alsace lorrainers surreptitiously crossed the frontier to come and enroll themselves in the foreign legion in eighteen seventy four at the end of three years of this regime of repression bismarck was willing to allow the alsace lorrainers the right possessed by german citizens of electing deputies to the reichstag the empire country could not itself be represented at the bundesrat since it had no autonomy but there was nothing to prevent its inhabitants since they were looked upon as germans from being represented at the reichstag then for the first time elections took place in the annexed provinces there were fifteen deputies to elect 
all the fifteen, despite the pressure exercised by a purely German administration in all the public offices, were protesting deputies. In the name of all, Monsieur Teutsch, deputy of the Saverne district, from the tribune of the Reichstag, read a protest which recalled that of their predecessors from the tribune at Bordeaux in 1871. Among other words used by M. Teutsch in that memorable sitting of the 18th of February, 1874, were these. In the teachings of morality and justice, we can find nothing, absolutely nothing, which can excuse our annexation to your empire. And in this, our reason finds itself in agreement with our heart. In truth, our heart is irresistibly attracted to our French motherland. Two centuries of life and thought in common create, between the members of the same family, a sacred tie which no argument and still less violence can destroy. The Polish deputies and two or three members of the Socialist Party applauded these noble words. From all the other benches there were protests and hoots. The Alsace-Lorraine deputies could only retire. It pleased the Chancellor in his speech of the 3rd of March to return to the scandalous manner in which Teutsch's protest had been received. The laughter and exclamations, he said, were in no wise, so far as I am able to judge, aimed at the cause M. Teutsch was defending, but at his not knowing how to modify his declamations and gesticulations before a German audience. What happened to this gentleman in his speech, without any fault of his, is what sometimes happens before a German audience to a French tragedian, who often finds it extraordinarily difficult to keep strictly within the limits outside which to the German mind, tragedy ceases. Is not this fashion of explaining, or rather this coarse, contemptuous irony on the part of the highest imperial official, worse than insult? End of section 9